Hi, I'm Dr. Scott Hahn, and I want to welcome you to The Road to Emmaus, a podcast from the St. Paul Center. And today we have a special treat, a dear friend, Father Gerald Murray, pastor at Holy Family Parish in Manhattan, across the street from the United Nations, has joined me for a conversation based upon a brand new book that is coming out from our own publishing arm, Emmaus Road, entitled Calming the Storm, Navigating the Crises Facing the Catholic Church and Society. Sounds like a really timely title to me. Father Murray, I want to say thank you for joining us, and also thank you for being here the last several days so that we're going to have an audio version of this book almost at the same time we're going to have the uh, the written published form, too. So tell me a little story about uh, the book, but let's begin by just summarizing a little of your own background. Well, Scott, it's great to be here, and it's a pleasure to meet uh, your team. You've got a wonderful team here oh, at St. Yes. Paul. Um, and it's been great working with Diane Montagna, who is a journalist I had known in Rome uh, and uh, does wonderful work there. So it was a great team effort. Uh, as regards my background, so I am a priest of the Archdiocese of New York. I was ordained in 1984 by Archbishop John O'Connor, then became Cardinal the year after I was ordained. And uh, as a priest of the Archdiocese, I've been stationed uh, mostly at the beginning in Hispanic parishes. I speak Spanish, so. Along with a few other languages. Well, I do. I speak French and Italian and no Portuguese and then Latin, but uh, the Spanish was very useful. I was in the South Bronx and in Northern Manhattan. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, after being assigned for two years at St. Patrick's Cathedral as one of the assistants, uh, Cardinal O'Connor sent me to Rome to study canon law. So from 93 to 97, it was my privilege uh, to be in the Eternal City. John Paul II uh, was uh, the Pope at the time, and a very inspiring and saintly man. And I learned the church's law and uh, became you know, familiar with uh, the role and importance of canon law in guiding the church, bishops, priests. Uh, and that's been helpful uh, because uh, when I came back to New York uh, after getting the degree, I began to be invited on television programs, mostly at Fox News, to analyze religious news. And you probably noticed that a lot of the commentators on Fox News and MSNBC, CNN are all lawyers. Yes. <laughs> they know how to argue their case and they know how to put it together in a, in a brief package. So I've been doing that for Fox News and a few other outlets. The world over. With well, that's our the good friend Raymond Arroyo. Uh, yes, and the papal posse. Exactly, yes. and that was a pleasure because uh, after being on Fox for a number of years, EWTN contacted me at the time of the papal resignation in, in twenty thirteen. Pope Benedict announced his resignation, and Raymond Arroyo asked me if I would be uh, one of the commentators on the coverage over in Rome. And that began uh, what became known as the Papal Posse. Right. So myself, uh, Bob Royal, at the time, Father Roger Landry, right. uh, who friend. was yeah, a wonderful priest, and he was in Rome covering that also with us. Uh, so after the election of Pope Francis, uh, when things got back to the normal, uh, meaning Raymond's in Washington, Bob Royal's there, and I'm in New York. That sense of normal. That yes. sense of normal, yes. 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 Exactly. Here we are back in America. And then let's talk about uh, the ongoing news in the church and the papal posse. Basically, once a month, we're on Raymond's program, and we analyze a lot of interesting news in the church, which uh, in some ways became the basis for this book, you know, to, right. because the book largely centers on discussing how Catholics can both understand and analyze and react to uh, the news in the church. So to understand what's happening and what's the appropriate reaction. There are several bullet points I'd like to indicate as sort of the backstory of this. I mean, way back in the foreground, you have, uh, uh, I should say in the background, you have two parents who met and fell in love at law school, right? And so you have law in your DNA. Uh, but you also have a pastoral approach that is rooted to canon law, the church's law. And we first met, I believe, around 2018. When we gave an award to Madeline Stebbins, God Rest Her Soul, in New York City, and then I spoke the next morning at the uh, at your parish. Yes, and it was an amazing time. You extended hospitality. I spent a night there as well, and I know Raymond Arroyo and others have done so 
also. But uh, the next year, it was really a, a, an exciting time for us to go back to Manhattan in order to give you the award, Defensor Fide, the Defender of the Faith, because what you had been doing in your teaching, your preaching, but also in your commentating on EWTN and Fox News was such a level-headed, solidly grounded, faithful, orthodox uh, approach to the faith. I mean, defending the faith, but also proclaiming the faith. And so we were really delighted not only to be able to award you the Defensor Fide Award, Defender of the Faith, but also to assemble Robert Royal and Raymond Arroyo, who kind of concelebrated a papal posse with me. <laughs> Non-liturgical, of course, but it was, uh, it was surreal for me to be with you and with them, and we ended up broadcasting that live that evening as well. And so it was around that time we began a conversation about, hey, look, Bishop Schneider, Bishop Athanasius Schneider and his book, Christus Vincent, has done such a great job in conversation with Diane Montagna. Why don't we, you know, take it from a theologian from Europe who did a phenomenal job, bring it down to a pastoral level so that you can speak theologically in terms of canon law, but you can speak, I think, more directly to ordinary Catholics. And so right off the bat, you know, when I texted uh, Diane in Rome, uh, she was very favorable towards this. And it just seemed to be right, except for one thing, the last part of the backstory, COVID, you know, because it was near the beginning of Lent uh, that Diane and I uh, had this exchange about doing a, a, a book-length conversation. But it was not for several months. It really wasn't until the fall, I understand, that she was able to get out here and meet up with you at the parish and begin the interviews that became the chapters that now form this book, calming the storm, navigating the crises, facing the Catholic Church and society. And another point or two, um, the, you always send on a manuscript to get endorsements, but you usually send it out to people that would just seem like a little beyond reach, uh, like Cardinal Sarah. And yet the blurb that he gave for this book is right from the heart. And likewise, Cardinal Mueller, the former prefect for the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and perhaps my favorite of all, Cardinal Raymond Burke. Uh, and his is one of the longest and most sincere uh, blurbs. I'm not going to read them, but I can tell you this, that if our audience could read them, they would buy this book in a heartbeat. And it's going to be available in a matter of uh, weeks. It might not be because of supply chain issues or the printer it might not be until the early part of 2022, but uh, I am convinced this book is going to do a whole lot of people a whole lot of good. And so on their behalf and on my own, I just want to say thanks again. But now, could you walk us through the book? Sure. Well, the idea is uh, basically the way uh, I talk on EWTN, you know, extended conversation about news in the church right. and, as you say, the theological canonical background, but then the pastoral application, how should the faithful live their faith amidst crises. Uh, so that's all in the background to uh, Diane Montagna came up with the idea that we would take the incident in the life of our Lord when he was asleep in the boat and they were crossing the sea and then suddenly the waves came up and the winds and the apostles panicked and the Lord said, oh, ye of little faith, and uh, the Lord calmed the storm. So uh, Let me press pause for just a moment and just say, pray tell, whence that inspiration? I mean, that is from the Holy Spirit because I think for a lot of the faithful at this point in time, given the confusion in the world, the nation, and especially our own church, it feels as though the Lord of Lords is fast asleep in the bow of the boat. And I, I'm sure he, he could have awakened earlier before they were in a panic. But I think it was a test of their faith just as it is a test of our faith. You it know? is. And the, it provided a great framework because we look at the crisis in the church is something the Lord, of course, he knows all things over all times. But he was preparing us for it by living out this experience and teaching the apostles a lesson. So when the Lord seems to be asleep, he may in fact be asleep in the boat, but right now, what's really, what are really asleep are the faithful have to wake up and turn to him yeah. and say, you know, the vessel of the church is in the hands of the Lord. Are we fully awake in faith and in devotion and in works of charity? 
And how informed are we about what's going on? I just want to, again, pause for a moment because that is one of the most striking and ironic reversals. It's like a photographic negative in the old days. You know, it looked as though the Lord was asleep physically while the disciples were awake physically, when in fact, he was wide awake spiritually, mm. and these guys were fast asleep spiritually. Exactly. They were really out of touch with how the Lordship of Christ is manifested, especially in the storms. And that's one question I think a lot of people ask. They would say, well, if God really loves us, why will he make us go through all these storms in the life of the church right now? Yeah. And the answer that Diane and I discussed this numerous times in the book is that we should never impose our set of expectations on divine providence. Right. In other words, divine providence plays itself out to instruct us, and our reaction has to be based on an acceptance of the way things are, not because they're necessarily, that's the, what God wants, because he certainly doesn't want sin, he doesn't want free people believing in heresy, but when those things happen, we have to turn to him and say, Lord, calm this storm, and right. we have to be effective. And one of the most important ways we're effective, have a proper understanding of who the Lord is, pray to him, and then imitate him. Right. You know, and imitating him reminds me of the prayer that was on his lips on Good Friday, taken from Psalm 22, from David the psalmist, who cries out, oh, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And of course, the psalmist felt forsaken, but not as forsaken as Jesus must have felt in his own human consciousness. And yet that same psalm that begins with a cry of dereliction ends with a triumphant note of thanksgiving and praise. And I think our Lord knew that when he was <laughs> quoting it. But at the same time, he wasn't just miming. He wasn't just kind of parroting lines. There really is a sense in which we can say as children to God the Father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he won't be offended so long as we recognize the fact that while we wouldn't do this to people we love, we're not God. We're mm -hmm. not that wise. We're not that loving. And so he puts us through things like COVID. He puts us through things like political upheaval. He puts Jesus through Calvary. And we hear in Romans and Hebrews 5, though a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered yes. and became the source of eternal salvation to all of those who obey him. And so we are going to have good Fridays and a lot of other days, not quite as extreme, but I, I think that is a healthy reminder. Something else that struck me in the endorsement that Cardinal Burke did give us, he said, with true fatherly affection and firmness, Father Murray unequivocally urges us to keep Christ at the center of our lives and reassures us that Christ is with us above all in the bark of St. Peter and that if we remain faithful in love with him, he will calm the stormy waters which would otherwise envelop and drown us. True fatherly affection and firmness really stands out because I come from a German background. I don't think you do, do you? 98% uh, Irish. There we are. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know, but I suspect that the Germanic temper has caused more world wars <laughs> than the Irish. Uh, the Irish might cause pub fights, but uh, <laughs> I always worry about expressing my anger because it invariably comes out sideways. And I look around and I see a whole lot of people who are focused, almost fixated upon the bad news, understandably, because it's not only there's more of it and it's worse than what any of us expected, but at the same time, it has such a debilitating effect. Uh, that anger, that sadness can easily paralyze us. But with fatherly firmness and affection, as Cardinal Burke says, you know, I, I think of how much we need leaders and especially father figures to counteract the false charge of toxic masculinity, but to really fill the leadership vacuum that we feel, you know, not only at the level of the executive office in our nation, but either also, you know, even in these, uh, in, in church positions as well. Well, see, then that's one of the things people, for instance, the German bishops have said that we should bless homosexual unions. Right. You know, this has been a big discussion point, and they got furious when the Vatican said no to this earlier this year. Um, so people say, well, how do we react to the German bishops? Does our respect for our fathers in Christ include just keeping quiet? And the answer is no. If you love your father when he does something wrong, you bring it to his attention. That's right. And if he's insistent on it, then you say, look, your vehemence 
trying to justify the unjustifiable doesn't convince me. Because by the way, you're not the guardians of the faithful. Jesus, you are supposed to be the guardians of the faithful, but what you're guarding is not your own message. It's the message of Christ. I try to make the point in the book numerous times that rational understanding of the gospel should never be cast aside simply because an authority figure contradicts it. If someone contradicts a teaching of the church, which has happened, sad to say, we say, look, this is what the church has always taught. This is the scriptural tradition basis. This is how the theologians explain it. If St. Thomas Aquinas didn't accept it, the chances are it's not true. For That's instance. right. So let's look at what happened in the past with these problems. Because, to, for instance, on the question of homosexuality, the idea that the church has been wrong for 2,000 years and now we've got to change our teaching, anyone who says that is subversive. That's not how we not understand Christianity. It's presumptuous. Yeah. God is the giver of the moral order. God is the creator. Right. So to affirm the truth with rational argumentation, even with some emotion, but, you know, one of the lessons of the gospel really has to be only the Lord could take the whip of cords and, uh, without sin, start throwing people out of the temple. Most of us are going to overdo it, so we should right. be calm about it. But, you know, the, the fact that the Lord did get upset, I always think back, the Lord said, Herod, that fox. Even the Lord used, you know, colorful language at times to make his point. So we do that, but our real strength is to say, Lord, calm the storm, and help us to be faithful. Yeah, that example of Herod, I think, is apt, because here is a royal ruler, you know, and so secular politics, I mean, he's clearly above the Lord. Now, obviously, he's not the Lord of Lords, but Jesus exemplifies an approach, you know, that, that allows for that kind of astute critique. Tell that fox. On the other hand, you know, I think what you're giving us is wisdom so that we can adjust or calibrate our own judgments and expressions so that it's not really fraternal correction that we would offer to a bishop or an archbishop or to a, you know, to a, an Episcopal conference in Germany or in the U.S., much less the Pope. But there is a filial correction. That is, you know, not as a little child would presume or dare to correct a parent, but as in a grown son or daughter. I get that from my kids, and I thank them for it. And uh, I, I think that kind of filial correction is an expression not of disrespect, but of friendship and respect. And to withhold it, in fact, can betray friendship and I think subvert the true status that we have as sons and daughters of God. We don't have many good models for doing it, but I think, as you just said a minute ago, you can't justify the unjustifiable. And it's not just 2,000 years of Catholic tradition, although that is more than sufficient. It's Judaism. It's Islam. It's the natural moral law. Sure. It's the universal truth of human nature that goes back to creation itself. Even for those who might question whether there was a creation, nevertheless, there's no question as to what human nature is and what perfects it. And so I, I think we have to recognize, I, I'm reminded as you were speaking of a friend of mine, a dear friend of more than 20 years, and you know, she went to confession and she confessed something that had to do with her own struggle with her orientation. And the priest you know, commanded her to, to go to a a gay bar, and celebrate her orientation. And she interrupted and politely said, Father, I'm going to step out of the confessional now, but before I do, I would encourage you to go to confession for what you just said to me. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. And I remember I was stirred wow. to the heart. Well, you see, this is one of the teachings of Vatican II was the, the equality of all the believers, of all the baptized. It was something they highlighted. Right. So while the, the, the lady or the sheep they're not the sheep in the sense of unreactive receptors right. of the gospel. You know, we are all called, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ. And the fellowship of faith is based on a mutual sharing. So mutual sharing also includes, <laughs> hey, get with the program here. You're a Catholic priest. You're telling me to go do something immoral. You need to repent of that. Right. That's beautiful. I'm thinking mutual sharing is right, but shearing <laughs> is not. They're not here just simply to shear the sheep. And, and, and we well, shouldn't uh, fleece the sheep that's either. Right. You know, yeah. That's another problem. Indeed. So again, walking through the book here, there are a number of, of points that are worth talking about. Okay, so you discuss in chapter one your own background, your yes. life and your vocation. That is so good. The anecdotes, the family, though. The way you dedicate this book to your father, to, right. 
Right. Well, my dad was, uh, he would be viewed as the ideal Catholic educational uh, product, we could use that word. He went to Catholic high school, Catholic college, Catholic law school, uh, was a daily mass goer, uh, loved the classics. Read, I mean, read National Review. Read National <laughs> Review magazine. No apologies there. He was a loyal American. And he taught me precisely the kind of thing that you know, I'm hoping we're going to pass on to people here, which is, he said to me, Jerry, you owe everything to your Catholic faith. You owe everything to the fact that God loved you and served you. You have to serve him in the church. He was happy when I became a priest. And then he used to, you know, I'm sure as you do with your kids, say, hey, did you see this? Did you hear that idea? <laughs> now you want to talk about this. He always had good things to teach me. And so I wanted to dedicate the book to him. My mom, they met in law school, you're right. Fordham Law, another Jesuit uh, school. And boy, you know, growing up in a house with two lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> I know your house has two theologians. So, <laughs> well, you, know, it, you learn how to reason. Actually, you, you learn, learn if you're sitting at a dinner table, you better not say, well, it has to be that way because I say so. Um, <laughs> change that tune. Back it up. Yes, exactly. Yeah. In the second chapter, you discuss the disunity that we have in the culture, but also in the church, it seems like we're living through an age of confusion unlike anything else in recent times. Uh, what takeaway, what advice, counsel would you give to people? Well, there are two things. To recognize that, to I say that there are problems in the church is not an act of disloyalty to the church. Right. And it's certainly not a, a la it's not a disrespect to the Pope. Uh, sad to say, Pope Francis, who we admire and pray for and love, he has done some things which make us scratch our heads, and quite frankly, were never done by previous popes. Right. Amoris Laetitia, the death penalty, Abu Dhabi statement that God wills all religions, things of this sort. And even the mode appropriate, but we might Well, we'll talk about the Latin Mass, too. Yeah. But no, in other words, he's done things that directly contradict what his predecessors said on a doctrinal level. So how are we supposed to interpret it? I go into that in the book, right. try to explain it, and again... The appeal is not to, you know, this priest says that, that one says that, you pick who you want to follow. The appeal is the Lord Jesus Christ revealed to the church his truth. The church has basically explicated, propagated, and explained that over 2,000 years. When things come along that don't fit in or don't seem to fit in, we have to sit down and do our homework, right. find out where it is. So that's what I try to do in the book. You know, and what you're doing in this book is what everyone needs to develop almost as a habit to habituate this sense of the supernatural. You know, a supernatural sense is what enables us to rise above right-wing, left-wing, conservative, liberal, to recognize, well, supernatural common sense, that what we have in the church in these sacred mysteries are what you can't find anywhere else in the world, and yet they're here for the salvation of the world and for our own souls and for us to become saints and nothing less. And if we keep our eyes really focused on Christ, that supernatural sense, that supernatural common sense, I think will become more and more of a habit for the faithful. And I'm seeing in the rising generation of younger clergy that same development, that same habituation. And mm -hmm. so I, I do think that uh, we're not going to be out of the confusion anytime soon, but I do think that people are going to find themselves, you know, clear-headed enough to actually provide leadership for their families, their parishes, and yes, sure. their, their diocese as well. Mm. Now, in chapter three, you also discuss what happens when prominent pastors and leaders who are in positions of authority also speak confusion. And what, uh, what lessons do we have from that? Well, uh, we have the lesson that um, the highest form of charity is to tell someone the truth. Right. Now, it has to be done in a way that is going to be most effective. And when it comes to a family member, since you have ongoing relationship and deep knowledge of each other, you can figure those things out a little more easily. When it comes to a public figure you have no access to, you, basically, you, you just have to express yourself to those in your circle of influence. But if you want to, you can take up the pen, you can write, uh, you can you know make known what's public, and certainly academics, journalists, uh, people in the public realm, they have a right, according to canon law, and a natural right to make known uh, what they disagree with in the leadership. I point out in the book a few times, Pope Francis has encouraged what he calls gospel frankness, parousia, Greek word. Right. 
He's also said criticism makes us better because it helps us re-examine what we've done. So I take him up on it and uh, I challenge him because, you know, on a couple of points, he, I don't think he's explained how, for instance, giving communion to divorced and remarried people fits in with the indissolubility of marriage. Likewise, on the death penalty, the Catholic Church has taught the legitimacy of the death penalty right from the start. He says it's a form of vengeance. It's an offense against human dignity. I don't agree. We need to, I think, look at that again in light of the tradition. Um, Not a page of scripture nor a doctor in the church agree with that either. Yes. Well, I, I say in my book, if, if the death penalty is immoral per se, then we're accusing God the Father of immorality because Genesis he commanded 9, it. 6, yes. Right. You know, Romans 13. by him whose his blood is spilled, his blood shall be spilled. So, it's, that's a problem. Now, I know most people don't like the death penalty from the point of view of en enacting it, but I guess what? I've been reading a book recently about Japanese atrocities in the Second World War. Uh, one way you defend the dignity of human life is you vindicate the rights of those who've been offended, and you also give the offender the clear understanding what he did is a serious offense, and it, he needs to be, you know, pay for it, so to speak. That's a longer discussion. Maybe we can do a well, show on that just, someday. Yeah, let me say one more thing, too, because the motivation has never been deterrence. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas uses the Latin term vindicatio. Yes, vindicatio. It's the vindication of the objective moral order. Exactly. And in Genesis 9, verse 6, you actually have, this doesn't in any way demean the dignity of man. Man was made in the image and likeness of God. So if you take the life of a man who bears the image and likeness of God, you forfeit that right to life, and likewise, it can be enforced because the authorities are not just simply exerting their own private power, but they're really exercising authority in the name of God, whose image and likeness they bear. And so yes. this is a conversation, I suppose, for another time. But, you know, you're right. I mean, Pope Francis has asked us, has really called us to exercise this virtue of heresia, that is, a boldness in approaching other people. But we don't go for the juggler. We go for the heart. Sure. Uh, we really want to reach the heart, and so uh, we, we express the truth with love. And at, at the same time, you know, uh, the anger of man does not work the righteousness of God, but we don't have to wait until we're completely devoid of any anger, or we will have to wait until we're buried. Yes, and in fact, um, anger is sort of like the, the central nervous system, you know, right. so that, uh, you know, if, if you cut your, your hand, it's going to hurt. It's a sign something's wrong. If you get angry when you see an injustice, it's a sign that your sense of justice is lively. You know, when I see what's going on, uh, for instance, our Christian brothers and sisters in Africa who are being, you know, Nigeria. killed in Nigeria yeah. by these terrorists in the name of Islam, and then you say to yourself, this is wrong. The government is too passive. They've got to protect these people. That's not unrighteous anger. No, that's now, right. it, it would be inhuman not to express Yes, it wouldn't anger. be. So I think but as regards the analogy for the church is, if Father X gets up in the pulpit and says, you know, we have to tell homosexual couples they're as welcome here as anybody else, the answer is anybody's welcome in the church. What we don't accept is people who are pledging to commit mortal sin with each other, that they should be treated as if they're married. Right. And that's not, that's not an offense against them. That's the, the act of justice in informing them what they need to do. Because, by the way, the standard is not what Father X says. What Jesus Christ says. Yeah, and when you're addressing an assembly of bishops, archbishops, and, and cardinals, such as you find uh, in Germany, you know, you find these clerics who are so much more inseparably united to the secular state and these liberal or postmodern values than they are to the magisterium and the word of God and scripture and tradition. I think they're deserving of at least a motu proprio or two. <laughs> Again, we can talk about that at a later time. Right. <laughs> you know, but one thing I'd like to discuss with you near the end of our conversation is uh, the experience that we've had together at the St. Paul Center, but especially with the priest retreat. Oh, yes. Uh, look back and just share your own reflections about what we were sharing together. Sure. No, one of the great things that the St. Paul Center does is offer these priest retreats, which are basically scriptural meditation uh, and reflection retreats at a very nice resort not far from here in West right. Virginia. And, you know, last one, what, there were 300 priests or something? Just about, yeah. I, so it was wonderful. You spoke beautifully. We had John Dr. Bergs, Bergs oh, speaking. Dr. Bergson, oh, he's uh, we had Larry, Larry Feingold, yes. Petrie, Tim Gray. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In fact, this year, in 2021, we had two conferences 
one in Texas in January since we couldn't do it in La Jolla because California was shut down. Mm. And that was maxed out. And they've invited us back again in 2022, a week or two after Easter, when priests really need to be renewed. Mm. We're going to go back to La Jolla uh, in January of 2022, expecting well over 200. And then again in Ogle Bay in yes. July. So yeah. for the first time, we're going to be doing three priest retreats in 2022 with over 600 mm. in attendance. And I must admit that that is the highlight of the year, not only for me, but for John Bergsma, for Tim Gray, for Larry Feingold, these lay people who are scholars, mostly converts, but not in not all of them. Uh, but to be able to give back to you priests after you have sacrificed so much, you've presided at the mass, you've heard our confessions, you've blessed our, our marriages and our kids and that kind of thing. Uh, and we go back all the way to 05, where we did it for the first time and began to discover year after year that there's a waiting list, that this, you know, and I, I realize that in canon law, you know, it is an annual obligation, a, mm -hmm. a norm right. for the priest to go on a retreat. But I, I talked to one priest who was describing what his brother priest had also experienced, and that is diocesan sponsored events that are very enmeshed in the bureaucracy, psychiatrists, lawyers, counselors, and this kind of thing, <laughs> you know, and then to have a conference that focuses on how to not only read scripture from the heart of the church, but how to show the connection and discover the depth of how the new is concealed in the old and how the Old Testament is revealed and fulfilled in the new, and not just back in the first century, but through the Holy Eucharist in the 21st century, every bit as much as it was back when Jesus was walking the streets of Palestine. And, you know, I, it is just an amazing experience. But I'll tell you one thing. To look out and see you at that one time, I was sort of, uh, I, you know, I was surprised, pleased, delighted, but also thinking, okay, we've got a tough crowd here, you know, professionally trained. No, no, we, we, we love it. In fact, um, you know, one of the great things that the St. Paul Center does, and you and your colleagues, is to bring the Old Testament alive, not simply as a historical subject, but as what it is, the preparation for the fulfillment. Right. And then... For, for us as Catholic priests preaching every Sunday, sometimes we don't understand how the first reading, usually taken from the Old Testament, relates to the gospel. But I have a much better sense of that, right. thanks to St. Paul's Center, yourself, the colleagues, because, you know, I think one of the great things we have to understand about Christianity, which is what you understand, God made the world in such a way that everything reaches its fulfillment in Christ, but everything didn't start with Christ, you know? Right. God prepared that, and that preparation is important for our knowledge. And sadly, in most seminary programs, the Old Testament really doesn't get a lot of study. And it's usually just, well, you got to know the Israelites were here, here, and here. <laughs> right. This happened to them, then they got exiled, and then they came back, and then Jesus came. That's not enough. No, when you're studying the New Testament apart from the Old, you're not getting sufficient background. I would say, I would go so far as to say that the New Testament is theologically unintelligible apart from the old. Yes. Just as the old is like a story in search of an ending, there are all of these promises that are left dangling yet to be fulfilled, and then Christ fulfills them in a way that goes beyond the Hebrews' highest hopes, you know. And when you think about what Jesus chose to do on his first day back from the dead, Easter Sunday, there must have been a lot of options. You know, <laughs> stop by Pilate, say hi to the Sanhedrin, <laughs> certainly his mother, but, you know, when you read Luke 24, you realize that his first day back from the dead was spent hours and hours of teaching scripture to yes. Clopas and his companion right. before they even recognized him. But their hearts are burning and then their eyes are opened in the breaking of the Eucharistic bread. And by the time they get back to Jerusalem, Jesus shows up again Easter Sunday evening to lead another lengthy scripture study for Peter and the apostles. Yeah. Now, you know, clearly Jesus wasn't wasting his time, but just as clearly, he must prioritize the importance and the value and the power of understanding sacred scripture to grasp the, the, the meaning of the Paschal mystery. Apart from the scriptures, the Paschal mystery just looked like, you know, a resuscitated victim, mm. you know. Yep. But when you look at it in light of the, the law and the prophets, the way we do year after year on these retreats, you come away saying, you know, it's amazing how unamazed we are at God becoming man, an infant. But not only that, a, you know, cruciform there on Good Friday. And then a consecrated host 
on the altar, in the tabernacle, upon our tongues. You know, it, 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 and it, then how about this? Entrusting this whole mission to a group of men, yeah. one of whom betrays him, Judas. Right. St. Peter denies him when he's under pressure. And then the Lord, when he sees them afterwards, sends them out, and they go out and preach the gospel to the whole world. So it shows the power of grace. So we shouldn't become so disappointed with our church leaders that we say everything's a mess. No. With God's grace, lots of good happens. That's right. You know, I, I think of Father Jeremiah, our son who was ordained on May 21st of 2021, and how special and sacred and surreal that was. But I also say, look at what God is doing with Father Murray. I mean, he's the son of two attorneys. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I won't go there, but I mean... They're, Everyone they're, needs an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I want to thank you, not only for spending the time with me in conversation, but also for spending the time with Diane Montagna for this book, Calming the Storm, Navigating the Crises Facing the Catholic Church and Society. We're going to provide our audience, uh, our viewers, with the information they need to order this book. But I do predict that in the year 2022, this will be one of the way, runaway religious bestsellers. But more than selling well, this is going to do a lot of people a lot of good. And thanks be to God for all of that. Well, I'll say, efforts. you know, that's what I've admired in Diane's work so far as a journalist, her book with Bishop Schneider. Yes. She has such a love of the church that she dedicates her energies to studying and preparing so well in order to bring forward people like Bishop Schneider, now myself. Um, this is the age of the laity. You know, yeah. that's something I think we have to understand. I think we do just by reality, but that's part of divine providence. So we should rejoice in that. Yeah, my closing thought, this is the age of the laity, but it's the age of a laity-clergy partnership, mm. the likes of which we haven't yeah. seen. And again, looking back on Luke 24, why would he spend the most of the day with Clopas and an unnamed friend, right. two apparent lowly lay people, you know? <laughs> and only at the end of Easter Sunday does he go back to our first pope mm -hmm. and the hierarchy. The first shall be last. Yeah, the and he brings them first. together. You know, yep, I, that's true. I, I love to picture Clopas just sharing with Peter and the others, and they're like, you know, yes. slack jawed. Like, <laughs> he you went know. to you first. Yeah. <laughs> What's your name again, Clopas? You want us to believe that he spent the first day back from the dead with you? You know, help thou our unbelief, you know. But Jesus averts any division by showing up in time sure. to bring them together. And I think that's what is happening in 101 different ways. And I hope it becomes 1,001. So I want to thank all of you for joining us for this podcast, uh, The Road to Emmaus. I also want to invite you to not only share the podcast with your family members and friends, but also share a link to this book, Calming the Storm, Navigating the Crises, Facing the Catholic Church and Society, Father Gerald Murray in conversation with Diane Montagna, published by Emmaus Road and coming out first thing in the year 2022. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and would you be the one who blesses us. Sure. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to God.